The National Desk, America's News, now. Iran and its proxies see uh, the United States as the primary backer of Israel and therefore hold the United States responsible for anything that they're angry at Israel about. American troops overseas continually under attack by Iranian-backed forces. Now the U.S. is striking back. Plus, consumers are learning to navigate inflation. This holiday shopping season is forecasted to be slower than last year's. We look at why and how shoppers plan to take advantage. Then, now I'm hearing about this, I'm just kind of like, you know, well, there goes my plans. But I mean, I'd, I'd rather play it safe than sorry. Canine contamination, the mysterious illness spreading across the country that could put your pet at risk. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk America's News. Now, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Dee Dee Gatton, and on this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week, and we look ahead at what to expect, starting with the four big stories we've been following this week. The CDC now reporting high levels of flu cases across the southeast in West Virginia. Dozens of families may be left in the cold after not being able to heat their homes for almost two weeks. Popular pouch snacks now blamed for making more kids ill, and the current mortgage rate is just one reason many would-be homeowners, especially younger ones, are putting off the big purchase. This holiday shopping season could bring some great deals. Retailers are trying to attract customers who have been pulling back spending in the face of high inflation. The National Desk Atra El Nishar explains what you can expect. After three years of through-the-roof spending, shoppers are coming back down to earth this holiday season. A slowdown in sales growth projected by the National Retail Federation reflects a return to pre-pandemic habits. The NRF projects a 3 to 4 percent increase from last year, similar growth to 2019, marking an end to three years of growth that drained inventory. Consumers are learning to navigate inflation. A new survey of Black Friday Cyber Monday plans from Deloitte finds consumers will prioritize items they expect to get on a discount like clothing and electronics. Consumers are looking to um, just kind of use these promotional events to get in and out of holiday gift giving in the most economical way possible. CEOs of both Walmart and Target say they've noticed customers manage their budgets more carefully. They're buying less stuff. We've seen seven consecutive quarters of both dollars and units declining. Throughout the industry, a decline in hiring too. Because of high labor costs and interest rates, retailers are expected to add the lowest number of seasonal positions since 2008, according to the employment firm Challenger Gray and Christmas. Inventories are also back to pre-pandemic norms. Gone are the days of supply chain disruptions and empty shelves. And to move that inventory during a time of slowed growth, retailers are offering their promotions earlier and earlier. Black Friday, now a week-long event. Same with Cyber Monday. Consumers, I think, know about Black Friday, Cyber Monday. They know what their favorite retailers typically offer. They are kind of expecting retailers to kind of roll out the red carpet this year and move in inventory. Stores hoping to keep Americans shopping at a time when they feel the need to pull back. In Washington, I'm Atra El Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. New details. The CDC reports high levels of flu cases across the southeast. Nine states and territories, including D.C., Georgia, South Carolina, and Alabama, are seeing surges as the flu season ramps up. Last year, the U.S. saw a moderately severe flu season, but this year's is expected to be worse. The Food and Drug Administration is reporting more cases of children getting sick from lead-tainted pouches of cinnamon applesauce. The FDA says it has now received 52 reports of elevated lead levels among children who ate the apple puree, up from 34 cases reported more than a week ago. The outbreak spanning 22 states is tied to fruit pouches from the brands Wanabana, Schnucks, and Wise. They were recalled late last month. To Charleston, West Virginia, where dozens of families forced to have the Thanksgiving away from their homes amid an ongoing gas outage that started almost two weeks ago. Mountaineer Gas says it's now restored service to more than 1,000 customers who lost it November 10th after a broken water main flooded more than 40 miles of service lines. 
But that does not mean their heating and cooking problems are solved. Each home must be visited by repair workers to check appliances and heaters for damage. It's kind of like a perfect storm restoration. If, if it was just the gas issue, we'd had everybody on a long time ago. But when you miss, mix gas or water in the gas lines and they get into the appliances, it's the appliances that's going to be the slow roll of getting everybody up to, to full capacity. The gas company says restoring all mainline service is still about three days away, but restoration to individual homes will still be a slow process for safety reasons. Massachusetts is forming a new state police unit to help combat hate crimes. The Hate Crime Awareness and Response Team, or HART, will use federal, state, and community partnerships to address the issue and identify trends. It will also develop training protocols to help police agencies better investigate hate crimes, as well as give schools $462,000 in hate crime prevention grants. Police departments in Massachusetts last year reported 440 hate crime incidents, which is an increase of 8.4 percent over 2021 alone. And it's the most incidents reported since 2002, so more than a 20-year high in hate crimes in Massachusetts. Those statistics cited are from last year. This year, the Council on American-Islamic Relations reports an unprecedented increase in documented anti-Arab and anti-Muslim bias incidents. The Anti-Defamation League reports a similar rise in anti-Semitic occurrences. American troops have come under attack at least 66 times since the war broke out between Israel and Gaza, and U.S. forces are striking back. So who is behind these attacks and why are they on the rise? The National Desk Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman looks into the flaring tensions and what the White House is doing about it. For President Biden, any holiday break hampered by another round of attacks on the U.S. military by Iranian-backed forces, at least 66 in the last month or so. Ever since the Israeli-Gaza war reached the current level of chaos, the instability and violence has spread, including to Iraq. By Iran-backed militias using a close-range ballistic missile against U.S. and coalition forces. Resulting in injuries to U.S. troops. The Pentagon striking back against enemy forces there using an AC-130 aircraft. Iran and its proxies see uh, the United States as the primary backer of Israel and therefore hold the United States responsible for anything that they're angry at Israel about. And it's why the president has put forward additional force posture so that we can send a strong signal to any actor, uh, nation state or otherwise, that uh, if you're going to think about widening and deepening this conflict, don't do it. Meanwhile, the White House is also concerned that Iran may provide Russia with missiles for its war with Ukraine. Iran is desperate for partners. Uh, it's a rogue regime. So increasingly is Russia. So that cooperation makes sense. But they also both are keenly interested in undermining uh, Western society and the U.S.-led international system. Republican critics saying Biden has been too weak on Iran by unfreezing funds, prisoner swaps, and letting Iran export oil to China without sanctions. Congressman Barry Moore wrote the Biden administration has fully abandoned President Trump's maximum pressure policy, calling it a slap in the face, especially to those in the military. The question now is what next? Could these Iranian-backed attacks on American troops and then retaliatory strikes by U.S. forces draw the two into a more intense conflict? In Washington, Scott Thuman for the National Desk. Representative George Santos facing possible removal from his position in the House after a report accused him of misusing campaign funds. I'm back with Connor from the Fact Check team. And Connor, what are the House rules surrounding campaign finance? Sure, Dee Dee. Well, House rules strictly ban using campaign funds for personal use, which includes meals and travel. And it also states campaign money must be kept separate from personal funds. So that's the House. Mm -hmm. What law governs this on a broader level? Hey, that's a good question. So that would be the Federal Election Campaign Act, which is enforced by the Federal Election Commission. And it bans using campaign funds for personal use 
includes as well, which it defines as any commitment, obligation, or expense that would exist irrespective of the candidate's campaign. In other words, if the expense would still exist even if the person wasn't a candidate or in office. All right, Connor, thank you for that. And for more on this fact check team topic, including links to their sources, scan the QR code on your screen or visit thenationaldesk.com. In your money, mortgage rates are on a downtrend after hitting a 23-year high last month. Right now, the average for a 30-year mortgage is hovering, as you can see, around 7.5%. Analysts predict the rate drop could continue, eyeing a possible 6% rate by spring. The current mortgage rate is just one reason many would-be homeowners, especially younger ones, are putting off the big purchase. Janae Bowens explains. Realtor Montez Dash is seeing a trend. A lot of them are compromising from the dream of owning a townhome or um, seeing a family home and going to a condominium. Younger people are having a hard time buying homes. More people who are buying houses now are already established in the market. Probably uh, second time home buyers. New research from the National Association of Realtors shows the average first time home buyer was 35 years old. In 1981, they were 29. This year's typical repeat buyer was 58. In 1981, they were 36. It's taking people longer in life to be able to build up their financials and be able to compete against buyers in low inventory um, and be able to enter the home buying game. The median household income of buyers was $107,000. That's almost $20,000 higher than it was last year. Experts point out the financial burden of higher home prices with limited supply and higher mortgage rates, which are above 7%. But things could get a little easier for younger Americans as rates are dropping and are expected to ease a bit in the spring. They will likely be getting lower rates and not likely be getting lower prices, um, given that there will be an a uh, rush of demand and buyers into the market. The national median price for a house is nearly $395,000. Now, experts tell me younger buyers are turning to stocks, bonds, and even selling cryptocurrency for additional financing to buy a home. In Washington, I'm Janae Bowens. Coming up next here, travelers finali finalizing their year-end holiday plans. They are looking to save, and one hack growing in popularity could come with some consequences. A travel expert has what you need to know about skip lagging. Then, a promising new treatment may help people struggling with long COVID recover their sense of smell. It's a so-called travel hack that's meant to save flyers some money, but the practice is highly frowned upon by airlines and could end up costing you more. Our Eugene Ramirez spoke to travel expert Katie Nastro about skip lagging and why it's so controversial. Uh, your website suggests skip lagging as a way to beat the airlines and save. What is it? How does it work? Sure. So skip lagging is actually a term called hidden city ticketing. And it's basically a way for people to fly to their destination without paying a direct flight price tag. So for example, say you wanted to fly from Orlando to New York, you know, see the city, but that price tag's a little bit out of budget. Maybe it's $150. However, you found a flight from Orlando to Richmond via New York, and that's only $88, which is a pretty nice savings. So you can actually take that flight from Orlando to New York and technically you're supposed to stay on that flight, continue on to Richmond. However, you got off in New York and you paid a fraction of the price for that direct flight price, but a but you bought a connecting flight. So in essence, it's basically like you bought a direct flight without the direct flight cost. So without doing what you're technically supposed to be doing, uh, the airlines have been canceling flights for some passengers that they catch in the act at check-in perhaps. They've even wiped out passengers' loyalty points and miles. Uh, they call it fraud, but is it really? Does it break the law? 
That's a great question. And technically it's not illegal, but it is forbidden in the fine print with the airline. It totally undermines the contract of carriage that you basically agree to when you purchase that flight. So it's basically an agreement that you make with the airlines that you are going to get on and get off where you say you your purchase will. And it's basically undermining how the airlines prices for different routes. And you know, additionally, they're losing money from a seat that you they could have potentially sold knowing that you weren't in fact going to take that second flight so sure. it's a missed opportunity for them yeah, yeah i get that I and mean, this still this isn't for everyone for example i love this i saw this on your website it says to pull this off you should only travel with a backpack uh, for many people it's <laughs> a big problem <laughs> why is that and what else should we know for willing to take the risk and uh, potentially uh, get caught by trying it yeah, well, you know, it is not for the novice traveler. It is definitely for someone who has traveled, you know, once or twice, you know, but you shouldn't be doing this multiple times a year, maybe once in a while, you know, every few years, um, you know. You don't want to tell anybody you're doing this, especially the airline, because again, like you had mentioned, they could cancel your entire ticket. And you don't want to check a bag as well. Like you mentioned, that bag gets checked to your final destination. And so you wouldn't be able to collect it at your connection because the airline doesn't know that that's actually your final connection. Yeah, as well as this only works for one ways. A return ticket will not work. And that's because if you skip that that first flight, don't get on that second flight, it cancels out your entire itinerary because you're counted as a no-show. So there's definitely things to remember. And again, it is, it is while it's not illegal, it is definitely not for the person that travels once in a while. And your back could end up in Cincinnati if you're headed to Miami. Hey, but people will jump through some hoops uh, to save some money. Katie Nastro, thanks so much. Thank you for having me. New details. A procedure typically used for chronic pain is showing promising results in restoring smell in long COVID patients. New research for, from Jefferson Health in Philadelphia suggests injecting an anesthetic into a certain part of the neck can reduce a distorted sense of smell known as parosmia. Doctors believe the treatment could act as a type of nervous system reset. The findings will be presented next Monday at an annual meeting of radiologists. Coming up next, canine contamination, the mysterious illness popping up around the country that could put your pet at risk. Plus, a surge in porch pirates. Police emphasize the need for heightened vigilance. The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America. We start in Nevada, where veterinarians are raising concerns about a mysterious illness impacting dogs. Right now, he's, he's uh, I think these are his last set of shots. And, you know, I'm over here, you know, excited to you know, take him to parks, you know, out of the house. Fernando Lobato is anxious to let Ace have some outdoor playtime, but... Now I'm hearing about this, I'm just kind of like, you know, well, there goes my plans. But, I mean, I'd, I'd rather play it safe than sorry. Safe than sorry because of a new and mysterious respiratory illness showing up in dogs around the U.S. So we don't really have a name for what's been seen in a lot of other states. Um, there is a respiratory disease that we aren't really able to identify what the underlying pathogen or cause is. Dr. Miller says symptoms include sneezing, nasal and eye discharge, coughing, and a lack of energy, similar to a common cold in humans. And while it may not have an official name just yet, Dr. Miller says a good way to protect your dog is to make sure that its shots are up to date. It's, it's kind of, it's unsettling knowing that I'm right in my house. And then little do I know someone's out there in my car because they're very quiet. They don't, they don't make a noise. So you don't know until the next morning. So it's, it's just unsettling. A haunting feeling, she says, knowing people have broken into her car just steps away from where she sleeps at night. 
Victoria tells me the first break-in happened nearly two years ago. You know, the first time it happened, they got um, a large amount of cash, and then I kind of was like, okay, I'm not going to do that again, not going to leave belongings in there. And then they just keep came, they just keep coming back. Victoria says she learned her lesson, but it still hasn't stopped criminals from trying to get in. Victoria believes they're looking for cash or even firearms. They hadn't taken anything that I know of the last couple times, but they make it very obvious and that they're looking for something specific. Starting this week, there's an even greater chance boxes and bags will be stolen off your front porch. These videos were taken from two local neighborhoods and show why the Austin area is once again ranked in the top 10 worst metros for packages being swiped off porches. That the holidays, especially everything that happens after Thanksgiving, uh, Black Friday, leading all the way up to Christmas. If a crook really wants your packages, a doorbell camera isn't likely to stop them. But the surveillance video gives police proof of a crime, a timeline, shows the suspects, and ideally, the license plates on their cars. Um, we benefit from them greatly. Today, Austin police said that even though doorbell cameras help solve crimes, these types of property thefts are not their highest priority especially with ongoing staffing shortages. Coming up next year, fed up with rising crime, how some citizens are holding officials accountable for the impact of their policies. Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, several northern states are bracing for a potential invasion of super pigs from Canada after several herds were spotted near the border. The invasive species causes billions of dollars in damages to U.S. crops each year. Daryl Hall, part of the rock duo Hall & Oates, has filed a lawsuit against former bandmate John Oates. The suit is listed as a contract debt dispute, but the details of the case are sealed. A 17-person flash mob hit a Los Angeles Nike store, taking $12,000 worth of goods with them. The LAPD believes the suspects are between 15 and 20 years old. Those stories and much more are available right now at thenationaldesk.com. As violent crime decreases nationwide, it's doing the opposite in California, and residents are looking to hold someone responsible. The National Desk, Kayla Gaskins, looks into the progressive prosecutor's facing recall efforts. Communities fed up with rising crime are pointing fingers at progressive district attorneys who often opt for lighter sentences and less jail time for criminals. My concern is public safety. According to FBI crime data, California's violent crime rate is 31% higher than the national average. In Alameda County, residents now pushing to recall their progressive prosecutor, Pamela Price. The recall effort reportedly close to getting the number of signatures needed to move forward. Anybody could be a victim at any time. Business owners are losing their businesses. People are losing their lives. And we continue to not see it as important. LA's progressive prosecutor George Gascon dodged two similar recall efforts in the last two years. San Franciscans removed their progressive DA, Chesa Boudin, last summer. Boudin, Gascon, and Price all received backing from groups tied to the far left activist billionaire mega donor, 
George Soros. Uh, Soros realized that you don't actually need to change the laws, you just need to change how they're enforced. Soros tends to focus on smaller races where donations can have a big impact. And one of the things he noticed was that in it, it, that, that the value for money in local races is much higher than it is in national races. It's an effective strategy. In 2022, one in five Americans were represented by a Soros-linked DA, according to data compiled by the Law Enforcement Legal Defense Fund. Aside from recalling DAs, citizens taking their frustrations to city council races. In Seattle, only three of nine city council members who led the 2020 defund the police movement were voted back into office. Leaders of the group pushing for the recall of Alameda County's progressive DA say they'll be visiting Washington, D.C. next month to meet with the Biden administration. In Washington, I'm Kayla Gaskins for the National Desk, America's News Now. New details. Olympic organizers will be releasing more than 400,000 new tickets for next year's Paris Olympics and Paralympics at the end of this month. The sale will start on November 30th at 10 a.m. on the official ticketing website and will be sold on a first-come, first-served basis. Seats will be available for all sports except surfing, and a third of the tickets will be sold for under $55. Ahead in our next half hour of the National Desk, America's News Now. President Biden's polls take a dip again, but how accurate is early polling? The fact check team joins us to break down the numbers. And slamming the brakes, the new report highlighting the hidden costs Americans are paying to fuel the president's push to go green. We talk with former White House economic advisor Steve Moore next. You're watching the National Desk, America's News Now, and you can catch us live weekdays from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time and anytime online at thenationaldesk.com. We'll be right back. The National Desk, America's News, now. The presidential debate calendar has been set, but will the party nominees even take part? The debate over debates, plus a pivotal workplace shift. The generation on track to overtake baby boomers in the office next year and later. I'm just old-fashioned, and I know it. <laughs> Spreading kindness through greeting cards, a veteran's mission to make sure his community feels loved. From the nation's capital, this is the National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton, and the election year is almost here, and some are wondering if presidential debates are disappearing. With President Biden seeking re-election, there's been no Democratic primary, and Republicans seem poised to possibly skip the general election debates next fall. The National Desk Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman explains why and what it means for voters. Could those on-stage stare-downs between presidential contenders be scrapped in the near future? This week, the schedule for three general election debates between the eventual nominees was set, though it's unclear if they'll actually happen. Will the president participate in it? I would refer to the campaign on that particular question. While that's for the general election, President Biden already balked at the idea of primary debates, choosing to all-out ignore Marianne Williamson and RFK Jr., who, partially for that reason, switched from a Democrat to an independent. And the Republican Party is boycotting the general election showdowns sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates, 
claiming unfair treatment in the past. And Donald Trump has yet to debate his Republican primary competitors. He owes it to you to be on this stage and explain why he should get another chance. The debate over debates intensifying as Trump and supporters pressure the GOP to stop the primary ones altogether, calling them a waste of time. He feels as the former president, he shouldn't have to be on the debate stage, that, that he's going to earn the nomination a different way. Presidential debates have taken place every election cycle since 1976, and in recent years, as many as two-thirds of Americans have said they've been helpful in making up their minds. And they've had critical impact dating back to 1960. The candidates need no introduction. When a more polished and camera-ready makeup-wearing John F. Kennedy squared off with a sweating Richard Nixon, who in turn lost that election. But as they rely instead on the bully pulpit, podcasts, or carefully curated TV appearances, those vying for your vote seem less interested in facing their opponents head-on and possibly leaving the podiums without an eventual president behind them. In Washington, Scott Thuman for the National Desk. President Biden turned 81 this week, and some voters aren't enthusiastic about the president seeking a second term. Our fact check team digs into a new poll. The latest poll out from NBC News puts President Biden two points behind former President Donald Trump in a hypothetical 2024 face off just under a year from right this moment. I'm back with Connor from the fact check team. How accurate are these early polls? Eugene, they are not the most accurate because a lot of intervening events can happen before election day that will make voters change their mind. According to Washington Monthly, early polls have only accurately predicted the correct winner of a presidential race in just three elections since 1976. And let's look at some examples of when early polling missed the mark. In a 2011 Washington Post ABC poll, Mitt Romney led Obama by four percentage points, but he ultimately lost to Obama in 2012. More recently, in 2015, Hillary Clinton led Trump by 10 points in a September 2015 CNN poll, but Trump ended up winning the Electoral College in 2016. Now, that one's still fresh in many voters' oh, memories yeah. right now. Uh, how accurate are political polls when they're conducted closer to the election? Good question, and here's what I found. 538 is a website that combines and analyzes a lot of polls that are commonly used, and they found that surveys taken 21 days before congressional and presidential elections have been correct 78% of the time since 1998 with a weighted average error of six points. Notably, the polls were more accurate than usual in 2022 with an average error of just 4.8 points. Yeah, better odds there yeah. uh, for accuracy. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Connor, thanks. For more of this fact check team topic, including links to Connor's sources, you want to scan the QR code on your screen or visit thenationaldesk.com. Talking about your money, President Biden has promised a fight against hidden junk fees on everything from airline tickets to credit card late charges. Now industry lobbyists are hitting back. The Washington Post reports corporations working to thwart rules requiring them to be transparent about after-purchase costs claim more transparency would confuse customers. Meantime, President Biden has directed regulators to limit fees to protect cash-strapped Americans. Look, folks, these are junk fees. They're unfair and they hit marginalized Americans the hardest, especially low-income folks and people of color. They benefit big corporations, not consumers, not working families. And that changes now. The White House says these fees add up to about $64 billion annually. The IRS is delaying a tax reporting requirement targeting Americans making more than $600 online through payment apps like Venmo or PayPal. The agency will instead treat 2023 as an additional transition year, meaning payment apps will not be required to send users the 1099-K form. This is the second straight time the reporting threshold has been delayed. The White House is rolling out billions of dollars in incentives and subsidies to entice Americans to buy electric vehicles. Our Angela Brown talks to former White House economic advisor Steve Moore about a new report the details what the real cost could be. This report is coming from the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And basically, um, they're saying the sticker price you see, maybe $50,000 for an electric car, is really much more than that when you factor in all the incentives um, uh, that's being offered, all the subsidies that, that add up to something like $22 billion. Uh, you went through this report. What do you think? What are the real costs when it comes to um, buying an MV? 
Well, the big story right now, Angela, with e EVs is that people aren't buying them. If you mm -hmm. go to auto dealers around the country, they'll tell you that their lots are filled with EVs and the gas cars that most customers want to buy, car buyers are much more interested at right now in gas powered cars than EVs. Those are becoming rarer. And so what's happening is, think about this. I mean, as you just said, we spend billions of dollars of tax money building the plants and, and uh, subsidizing the batteries for these cars. And that's your and my uh, tax dollars. And then the, go the federal government gives you a $7,500 payment if you buy an EV. Plus, Angela, there are many states that then add, add in another two to $5,000 of incentives to buy these cars. Mm -hmm. And then of course, once you buy them, they're providing you in many cases, the electric power to charge your batteries um, a, basically for free, which would be like giving people gas, you know, gas for free for their cars. And yet with all those incentives, Angela, people aren't st still aren't buying them. And so I think there's a real problem for the auto industry. We will see whether people's uh, attitudes about EVs change. Look, I'm not against electric vehicles. Right. They're amazing cars in a lot of ways. But for what a lot of consumers are saying, Angela, is that, you know, if you're driving in the city, you know, on short distances, then electric vehicles can be, you know, uh, very convenient cars. But if you're, tr you know, making long trips, yeah. you know, where the battery has to be recharged, that's a big problem for people. And it seems like we're on the path where you have not only companies, you have the federal government, you have state uh, governments, you have the federal government heading towards uh, promoting and pushing more electric vehicles. I worry that if we have the entire transportation system on our electric grid, Angela, that's going to put pose a lot of risks. I mean, we have our we heat our homes, we you know, our factories, our schools, our uh, our hospitals. They all are on the electric grid system. Now we're going to put the entire transportation system on. There's a lot of people who are experts in this area who are saying, "Wait a minute, the the electric grid system is not ready. It's going to make it incredibly vulnerable." If you get if you get a a blackout or a brownout, it's going to completely paralyze our economy. So there are some risks with this that people should be aware of. And you can view the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Coming up next, a blue collar boom. Why small businesses are foregoing college education job seekers and turning more towards experienced workers. Welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. Our chief political correspondent, Scott Thuman, joins me to share his insights on the stories he's been covering. President Biden turned 81 this past week, and polls consistently show voters raising an issue about his age as he seeks a second term in office. But it seems the reality is the concerns are less about the fact that he's 81 and more about his fitness, uh, whether he's fit enough to serve for the next five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right about that, Steve. And let's first talk about the age issue because, look, at the end of a second term, if reelected, he would be 86, already the oldest president in, in American history. And then next in line would have been Ronald Reagan, who was 77 at the end of his second term. So there's a pretty big disparity there. Um, but when you talk to voters and you read these surveys and the polls, you do see the concern on a different level. First, you've got a third of Americans, less than a third, who believe he is competent to do the job. That is obviously difficult when you are trying to run a re-election campaign. But on top of that, as you alluded to, whether he's got the mental health and acuity to do the job, 64% uh, say they're worried that he does not have that ability. And that's something that's going to stack up against him, especially as his campaign goes on and on. And it's something that Democrats and others are, uh, will continue to talk about. And it's going to be something he's going to have to answer for from now until Election Day, uh, especially if he's the nominee. Uh, but his fitness for office is just the tip of the iceberg as he faces stiff polling headwinds on key issues as well. 
Yeah, I mean, let's take immigration, for example, because it's one that's been a steady, const constant concern, uh, not just for this administration, but previous ones. But if you look at it right now, you have record number of border crossings or apprehensions, uh, 2.5 million in the fiscal year of 2023. So you have a huge number there, and obviously a lot of pressure on the White House to do something about it. No White House has come up with that magic bullet yet, nor has Congress. So that's not an easy fix, but at the same time, there is always some sort of blame assessed. And when people were asked, who do you trust more to handle the issue of immigration and border security, only 27% said President Biden and 50% said former President Donald Trump. And when you consider the fact that right now President Biden is down, I don't know, about seven or eight points in some of the latest polls to Trump in a theoretical head-to-head -head matchup, if the immigration issue continues to be a big one moving forward, that's going to hurt him as well. Right, and the economy especially as well. It's something that's been dogging him for months now. Uh, it seems like he hasn't figured out a way to speak to voters about that. And there are people within the party, within the Democratic Party, saying, hey, you got to change your message on this. Try to figure out a way to convince Americans that what you're doing is going to help them in the long run. Anyway, turning to Capitol Hill, lawmakers punting a government shutdown deadline until after the new year. Uh, but when they return Tuesday, they still have a ton of work to do between now and their end of the year break. Yeah, they absolutely do. I mean, it's not just about trying to avert another government shutdown when the next omnibus or, in this case, continuing resolution runs out. But it's about uh, some of these bigger issues where there are really tough fights going on on Capitol Hill, where people are at great odds with each other. For example, funding for uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, how much more is America going to support and how long will they keep the purse strings open because uh, people are getting frustrated at that spending, especially when they see domestic issues here that they believe need better taken care of. And then the same going now on with the discussion about funding for the Israeli-Gaza war. How much are Americans willing to foot the bill to help Israel? Uh, and you see that fight playing out in the streets across the country with protests on both sides of the issue. But quickly, Steve, we can go back to what you were talking about with Bidenomics, as he likes to call it. He has been running on that, President Biden, saying, look, I am getting a lot done. Um, and he can boast of high job numbers and low unemployment. But overall, as you point out, until Americans feel that their dollar is going a real long way, um, they're just not super supportive of what this administration is doing. And they have to rethink whether or not they want to keep touting Bidenomics if it doesn't sit well with the average voter. Right. And the reality is that prices are up from uh, when he took office to now, and they're probably not going to go down. They may level off and they may not go up as much, but there's still a significant uh, set of higher prices for Americans from just two years ago to now. Yeah, it takes a long time to turn that ship. Yep. Anyway, Chief Political Correspondent Scott Thuman, always great to have you reporting your insights. Uh, well, uh, I thank you and back to you. Developing now, Gen Z is poised to overtake baby boomers in the workforce by early next year. According to a Glassdoor analysis, Zoomers are beginning to make up an important share of the American workforce. It's a pivotal shift that has been long coming as boomers phase out of the workplace. Gen Z still has a long way to go before asserting control. Millennials are expected to dominate the workforce until early 2040. And the shift comes as a new survey found many small businesses are dissatisfied with college-educated job seekers. The National Desk's Angela Brown is looking into the report. A new report coming from the Freedom Economy Index surveyed over 70,000 small businesses between October 25th and October 30th with 905 responding. This stood out. 67% of small businesses said colleges and universities are not graduating students with relevant skills that today's business community needs. Nicholas Giordano, Campus Reform. You have all these small businesses that are moving away from college degrees, and it's falling in line with what we're seeing from large corporations like Google and Tesla, uh, corporate Walmart and IBM, and also states like New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania and Virginia, that have all done away with their four-year degree requirements. And then there's this. When asked whether they were more or less likely to consider a candidate with a four-year degree, roughly 42% said it made no difference. The Freedom Economy Index comes from Public Square and Red Balloon. Public Square coined as an anti-woke shopping app. And Red Balloon says on its website it helps connect people with freedom-aligned employers. Another survey echoing the sentiment comes from Intelligent.com, an online education magazine. 40% of business leaders believe recent college grads are unprepared for the workforce. In Washington, D.C., I'm Angela Brown. 
New details, the number of households without children is increasing, currently sitting at 43%. According to new Census Bureau data, that's up 7% since 2012. Pew Research finds more and more people ages 18 to 49 say they don't want kids. HubScore has ranked the best states for so-called dinks or double-income no-kids couples to live. The top three are Minnesota, Maine, and Colorado. Coming up next, wrong arrest, a bizarre turn of events in which police nabbed the wrong person who still ended up being a danger to the community. Then, spreading holiday cheer, a community comes together to send care packages to our servicemen and women overseas. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. We have reporters all across the country in your neighborhoods covering issues that matter to you. We start in Washington State where a police chase ended with the arrest of the wrong wanted suspect. This is one case of mistaken identity that'll stand out to bartender Aria Ermler. It was right here in front of her tavern where deputies thought they nabbed a particular suspect only to discover it was someone else. I mean, what are the chances? <laughs> but at least they got someone off the streets, right? For more than three miles through Tacoma, the chase was on when that suspect wiped out here. Ariel says it was a sobering sight. I was like, what could this guy have possibly done to attract this many police officers? <laughs> like he had to have done something real crazy. Well, the man arrested here wasn't the person deputies thought he was. They say he still led them on a dangerous chase. This pursuit ended when the suspect crashed into another car, slightly hurting three people. Despite this case of mistaken identity, deputies say the man here had a felony warrant and is considered dangerous. About property damage not blocking, they're on the parkway in Waterford Road. Two vehicles, call in state smell injuries. This call on police radio around 8.15 Monday morning would lead Macedon police officers to their boss, Chief Fabian Rivera. The Wayne County Sheriff's Office says he crashed his patrol car on Waterford Road in Walworth. The debris still on the road at the crash site, just across the street from the Gnanda Elementary School. No injuries were reported, but the car was towed from the scene. Investigators say when officers suspected their boss may have been intoxicated, they called in the Wayne County Sheriff's Office, which charged Fabian Rivera with several DWI-related offenses. At the end of October, Squadron 89 was deployed without knowing when they would be home. This hit close to home for one group of friends. Our group of friends, and we all hang out here at Larry's and all that, and just like, let's get something together for his team. You know, there's 12 guys on his flight crew. And then it expanded. And then by Tuesday, I was like, let's cover everybody on the base. To take on such a challenge, they decided to host a donation drive to collect items for the holidays at O'Leary's Pub in Centerville Sunday night. As the event built traction, Viking Heating and Air donated $1,000 to help with shipping, and Blue Star Mothers also got involved. Our chapter yesterday, um, we made 141 stockings that we're going to be sending out to them, um, and we will be supporting them or we will continue supporting them into the, the remainder of their deployment. Still ahead, Cards of Kindness. A 97-year-old veteran is making it his mission to let others know he's thinking about them.
If you are thinking of getting a puppy over the holidays, you may want to consider which breed is your wallet's best friend. According to the Wall Street Journal, the best bark for your buck is a rat terrier or its close cousin, the Jack Russell. They live about 15 years and have lifetime expenses of just over $28,000. The most expensive, the Tibetan Mastiff, cost nearly $49,000 to maintain over their average 11-year lifespan. And right now, a Rhode Island veteran with a love for expressing his emotions is known for his cards of kindness. You might have heard about people asking for cards, but this time around, he's the one sending them. The National Desk, Sam Reed, shows us something good. While most people slow down at an older age, 97-year-old Hassan Sally's hobby is only picking up. I'm just old-fashioned and I know it. <laughs> Putting pencil to paper, this veteran says he has a lot to be thankful for. And this little black book consists of hundreds of friends and family members with important dates like birthdays and other notable celebrations. Hassan wouldn't dare miss an opportunity to wish them well. While I'm doing them, is a big good feeling in me that I'm doing something good for somebody else. For decades, his daughter says he's always made it his mission to let others know he's thinking of them with a card. He's always done that his whole life. So when the pandemic hit and he couldn't go out and buy them, a pen pal friend who learned he was lonely sent him blank ones and encouraged him to keep up with the kindness. And I started coloring and I said, geez, I'd love to do this. <laughs> From there, things took off. He did about 120. And every day, he sits at his desk, coloring a card and writing something sentimental. I'm thinking of the person that it's going to, you know, and hoping that they will receive it in good faith. Patty Secord first met Hassan when she moved in next door. For his birthday this past June, she gifted him a bottle of wine. And he gave me, he wrote me a card back, a handwritten card thanking me. Proud that we are neighbors and hope to see you often. Shocked and equally impressed, Patty held on to that card. The thoughtfulness of getting a handwritten card, handwritten thank you, is not normal these days. In fact, it meant so much to her, it was brought up in conversation with other neighbors, Sally and Bob Mitchell. I didn't know. I thought I was special. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he does it for all the neighbors. When the Mitchells moved into the neighborhood, Hassan was the first to welcome them. It really is very kind. Many months ago, they had a conversation with him at a neighborhood community center where they told him they were expecting their seventh grandchild. A great time to rejoice. And of course, that stuck with this family man. Congrats on being the proud grandparents. Much love and happiness. The Mitchells received many messages, but this one really stuck was deeply meaningful. I mean, he's just, he's just such a great person. And as the pandemic becomes a thing of the past, Hassan says he'll stick to his homemade cards. And while Hallmark may have lost a customer, Hassan has gained a few forever friends. When they tell me that they enjoyed the card, it was worth doing it. Showing you something good. I'm Sam Reed. Love to see the thoughtfulness. That'll be all for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Just check your local listings. You can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks for watching the weekend edition of the National Desk. I'm Didi Gatton, and from all of us here, have a great week.